My name is Michael Davidson, and here's what's going on at Abundant Life. Coming in August is our next men's huddle, where we'll unpack what it means to be a godly, courageous man in today's world. Through engaging stories, expert teaching, unscripted interviews, and personal insights, this study calls every man to become bold leaders in their own lives, marriages, churches, and communities. Plan to join the men of ALCF community for this exciting series on Saturdays, August 25th through November 10th, and the cost is $25. In September, we've got some exciting events planned, starting with an evening with Tim Keller, hosted by Transforming the Bay with Christ. Pastor Tim, a pastor and New York Times best-selling author, speaks about the church as an unstoppable force and shares his views on what a radical Christian community looks like. Join us on Thursday, September 6th from 7.30 to 9 p.m. in the ALCF Sanctuary for this unique event. Tickets are $20. On September 23rd, we launched two classes, Jesus Among Secular Gods and The Art of Parenting. Living in the Bay Area's high-tech center of the world, we are often confronted with questions about science versus religion. In Jesus Among Secular Gods, Valerie Saunders, our Director of Evangelism, uses a video chat workshop format to help us prepare to challenge the isms of modern belief, including world religions and views, and present compelling evidence for revealed absolute truth as found in Jesus. This six-week class helps seekers to explore claims of Christ and will provide Christians with knowledge to articulate why they believe Jesus stands tall above all other gods. The cost is $25, includes childcare with pre-registration. Also on September 23rd, The Art of Parenting, developed by Family Life Today, helps parents feel confident in building a foundation for their children in four key areas, identity, character, relationships, and mission. This eight-week DVD small group curriculum based on Psalm 127.4, features insights and decades of expertise that Dennis and Barbara Rainey gleaned from ministry and raising six children. Facilitated by Zeke and Marie Harvey, we will explore the following topics. The goal of parenting, forming character, applying discipline, building relationships, understanding identity, nurturing identity, preparing for mission, and the power of family. The cost is $40 per couple, which includes childcare with pre-registration. Space is limited to 24 couples. Are you new to Abundant Life? Are you interested in learning more about our story, dreams, and values in a welcoming environment with no pressure to join? If so, our guest orientation lunch is just the place for you. Find out what we're all about on Sunday, September 9th from 12 to 1 p.m. in the chapel. And speaking of values, going is one of ALCF's core values. As born again believers, God commanded us to go and make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28, 19. In order to prepare you to go, we invite you to participate in one of four trainings being offered each Sunday in August from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Another great opportunity to go and bring the hope of Jesus to people in need is the Johnny and Friends Bay Area Walk and Roll event on September 15th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Mitchell Park in Palo Alto. Join us for this one-of-a-kind fundraising event. All of the money raised will bring Christ-centered encouragement and practical support to special need families in the community. You can sign up from August 17th through September 15th at johnnyandfriends.org slash Bay Area. Now, are you ready for some fun? What about ALCF's annual church picnic? Make plans to join the ALCF community for our most popular event of the year and be part of a great afternoon of fellowship, fun, food, and games. This year's event will take place on Sunday, September 16th from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. at Ringstore Park in Mountain View. And if you're available to help out, please come to our volunteer meeting on Sunday, August 12th from 12 to 12.30 p.m. 
to sign up for any of the upcoming events and classes, go to alcf.net slash signups or the ALCF app. To stay connected with everything ALCF, check out the website, app, bi-weekly emails, newsletter, social media, and remember, at ALCF, our goal is to make a difference in your life so that you can make a difference in the lives of the people in your sphere of influence. Or as we like to say around here, abundant life exists to make a better you for a better world. And so Father, would you speak to us now from your word? God, we sense your presence is in this place. And so Father God, would you walk the aisles as your word goes forth? Would you encourage us? Would you uplift us? Would you challenge us? Would you confront us? But ultimately, Lord God, would you change us? Save someone's soul, add to your church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, please meet me in Ruth chapter 4. If you're new with us, we've been on a journey through the book of Ruth. Ruth has four chapters, and each week we've been looking at a chapter in the narrative, the story of Ruth. And today is the final installment on our four-part walk through the book of Ruth. As you're turning there, a couple of things. Um, men's huddle, we are going to kick off our, our study called Stepping Up. It's a family life study led by my mentor, Dennis Rainey. Uh, men, if you haven't done so already, please sign up. And you need to know if you can't afford to go, so many men have actually given so much extra money that we've got scholarships for just about any man who has yet to sign up. So there's no excuse. Join us uh, this coming Saturday at 8.30 a.m. We'll have you out by uh, 10 a.m. Uh, also want to encourage you, and two weeks is our annual church picnic. It's going to be a fun time. Uh, we always have great food, and then uh, we had a little spades action going on last year. My team won. Uh, and if you lose to me, the, uh, your name gets put in the bulletin uh, in the newsletter, having lost. If you win, no one will know about it. Uh, and then also, for those of you who've been coming but you want to hear more about the vision and values of our church, the story of abundant life, please meet us next Sunday at noon right after service in the fellowship hall. One hour, we'll have a lunch provided for you, child care for your kids if you have kids, and we would just like to walk through what life at abundant life looks like. Also, we've got uh, Evangelism Sunday is coming up next Sunday. Uh, pick up one of these cards, several of these cards. We're going to actually be going out and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ uh, in our community. And God doesn't want us to just have church. He wants us to be the church. Amen. I got one clap. I got one clap on that one. So, um, We've got a wonderful card uh, for you. Pick up several of those, and then we'll be sending some teams out next week. Ruth chapter 4, pick me up in verse 1. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friends, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I'd tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you'll redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not tell me, that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. Bless you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field, I love it. This is, talk about a disclaimer in your contract. The day you buy the field from the land of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, nah, I can't do it. I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. 
Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz, verse 13, took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is more to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap, lap and became his nurse. Literally, the Hebrew word for nurse, it's, it's foster mom. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Amenadab. Man, reading the Old Testament will lengthen your vocabulary. Amenadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, many of you all know our story. Uh, we moved here from New York City, but prior to that, uh, we had asked the Lord to send us to the toughest place in the country to plant a multi-ethnic church. Um, I just felt like um, the um, two big institutions of, of uh, segregation still today is the Greek system on the college campus and the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, the 11 o'clock hour, as Dr. King would say, is the most segregated hour of the week. And so I would just read the Bible and I'd be like, man, God, Jesus, when he talks about heaven, he's like, man, people are going to be there from every nation, tribe, and tongue. Heaven's going to be multi-ethnic. Why isn't that happening here on earth? I don't want to have to wait until I die to experience it. I'd actually like to begin to experience that right now. So we asked the Lord to send us to the toughest place in the country to do it. It was Memphis, Tennessee for a whole host of reasons. And for 12 years, we labored from 26 people in the living room to over several thousand who ended up coming. Uh, it was about half white, half black. It was just a beautiful thing to witness. And it was a, it was a great time. Um, on many levels, we bought a great house that we loved. I think we had like almost 4,000 square feet. We paid like five bucks for it. It was just absolutely amazing. And uh, it was just, just an incredible time there. Finally, uh, God calls us from there to go to New York City, our last day at the house. Um, my kids wanted to do something in, in our house, the house they'd grown up in, uh, that was incredibly exciting, slightly illegal. Uh, but I went ahead and let them do it. They, uh, they wanted to take a Sharpie and go to some obscure places in the house. And they just simply wrote the words, Quentin was here. Miles was here. Jaden was here. Still waiting on that phone call. Haven't gotten it just yet. But it's just interesting that my kids wanted to leave a mark. In this place that had so many memories, in this place where they had logs, so many meals, so many times of experiences, laughter, crying. When they left, they didn't just want to leave, they wanted to leave their, their mark. In a sense, that's all of us. 
All of us are leasing time on God's green earth in the house that is, that is, that is this world. And there's going to come a time when God's going to say, give me back my breath. We shall behold him face to face. We're, we don't own anything. We're leasing. Job says it this way, naked I came into this world and naked I shall return. I've done a whole lot of funerals in my life. I've seen a whole lot of crazy things. I've never seen a U-Haul truck at a gravesite. Those shoes you just had to have ain't going with you. That outfit, those golf clubs, it ain't going with you. That life insurance policy that you left behind might get spent on the next dude. Naked you came into this world, and naked you shall return. But I think there is something innate to all of humanity, no matter where you may be on the spiritual spectrum, all of us in our own way want to write, Brian was here, Corey was here, Trevor was here. We all want to leave our mark. We, we all want to leave a legacy. Isn't that what the rapper J.C. talks about? On his latest album, he's literally got a, got a song, a track titled Legacy, in which he's talking about the things that he wants to leave behind. And I wouldn't necessarily call him a Christian, but it just speaks to this thing. Biggie talked about it. When he talked about it in one of his songs, that he's got to get his daughter this college grand so she won't need no man. I'm out on the deep end today. I'm quoting Biggie and Jay-Z. and I may not have a church, Samaj, when it's all said and done. They might vote me up out of here. But we all want to leave our mark. That's why you're going to work and you're working so hard and saving money and trying to figure out ways to facilitate your kids' dreams. You, you, you're, you, you've got the life insurance policy. That's, that's what you're doing. You, you, you want to leave your mark. And in a sense, you're right in wanting to do that. In fact, the Bible says, I, I think it's a great verse, every kid should be able to quote to their dads, Proverbs 13, 22, a, a, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. I said it to my dad all the time and I always end by saying, are you a good man? There's something to be said for wanting to leave our mark. This morning, I want to talk to you about legacy, this, this thing in us that innately says we don't, we don't want to just appear one day and disappear, not, not having left any, as the, as the poet said, footprints in the sand. We, we want to leave some marks. We, 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 we want to be able to say that, that we were here and that, that we influenced humanity for good. When we talk about legacy, you've got to understand that the length of your legacy is in direct proportion to your vision of time. I'll give it to you again. The length of your legacy is in direct proportion to your vision or worldview of time. What do I mean by that? If you think that this life is all there is, then the chances of you leaving a legacy that will, that will impact generations to come for eternity is nil. In fact, it was the great literary figure, Fyodor Dostoevsky, who said it this way. He says, without God and the future life, everything is permitted. One can do anything. What is Dostoevsky saying? He's saying, fundamentally, Brian, if you think that this life is all there is, then why not just turn this life into one big hedonistic party? Have all the sex you want, drink as much as you want, spend money any old way you want if this life is all there is. That's your vision of life. It's a small vision. 
fact, if you just span the spectrum of world history, in fact, I won't go any further than the 20th century, it is interesting that those who have had the most destructive impact on humanity were those who actually subscribed to a worldview that says this world is all there is. They had a small vision. Or hear what the great C.S. Lewis said on the flip side. One of my favorite C.S. Lewis quotes, he says, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. What you think about eternity matters. We all have a worldview. So if you think this life is all there is, why not, as the guy, the rich landowner says, eat, drink, and be merry. Just Cupid shuffle your way into the grave. To the left, to the... Let me stop. Biggie, Jay-Z, Cupid shuffle... But if you actually believe that this life is not all there is, that I'm going to have to give an account to a God who created me, who loved me, who gave his only son to die on the cross for me, then that has profound implications for how I navigate marriage, how I treat my wife, how I steward money. There's one word that sums up Ruth chapter 4. I want you to write it in your notes app or in the margin of your Bible. It is the word legacy. Chapter 1, the word was pain. Chapter 2, the word was providence. Chapter 3, the word was faith. Chapter 4, the word is legacy. Think about it. Here's Ruth, this, this immigrant who's gone through a lot of pain and suffering. She's from this backwoods place called Fresno, I mean Moab. Email me at pastorgary at alcf.net. And what happens? She gets worked into the lineage of not just David, but I got a bombshell for you. According to Matthew chapter 1, she gets worked into the lineage of Jesus. She is the least likely of candidates. How does she get in there? Grace. It wasn't because she made the best choices. It was all the grace of God. Now, this encourages me because God specializes in taking unlikely candidates from backwoods places, from the wrong sides of the track, and if he can do it with Ruth, he can do it with me, and he can do it for you. This is a profound story. I don't care what your mama did. I don't care what your daddy did. I don't care what they said about you. God can work something special in your life. He can create a legacy. He can do something amazing. I want to point out to you today three things about legacy. First, we come to chapter one, and excuse me, chapter four, and, and you got to understand that chapter four is right on the heels of a very dramatic scene in chapter three. Here is Ruth. She's again an immigrant. She's a widow. She struggled with infertility. Uh, she, she didn't have any kids. She, she hitches her wagon to Naomi. She says, where, where you go, I'll go. Your God will be my God. I am with you. Ride or die. She comes from Moab now to Bethlehem. Uh, she's on the brink of starvation. Chapter 2, she, she ends up going to work. She's, um, she's gleaning in a field, picking up the scraps. Again, the image here is a homeless person with their cart picking up aluminum cans. It's subsistence existence. That is what she does. And in the providence of God, she comes across Boaz. Chapter 3, in a real crazy way, uh, Naomi tells her to put on her wedding dress, hop into the bed with Boaz, propose marriage to him. Boaz says, I'm willing to do it, but I got to tell you, there's a caveat. There's a redeemer who is closer than I. So I've got to see if 
If he wants to redeem you first, if he doesn't, I've got your back. Now the curtain lifts on chapter 4. It is a scene that is filled with tension. Boaz is standing at the gate. The gate is, is kind of where um, the city's town hall would be. It was where you made all of the decisions. Here is Boaz standing at the gate. That's where the entrepreneurs would go in and out of. And he sees the uh, redeemer who is closer in line than he. And he says, turn aside, friend. And he makes a proposal to you to him. There's Naomi, a relative of ours, he says. And she's got a plot of land that's available. He's thinking real estate, wonderful. He says, but, disclaimer, the day you redeem it, you've got to take along with you Naomi and Ruth, and you've got to, verse 5, perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. We don't understand this today, but but, but God was very concerned that, that no family would ever have their name blotted out, that no family would ever die out. And so God actually stipulated in his word that if there was a person like a Naomi or Ruth who was childless, that the next of kin, his job on top of raising his own family was to start a family with this woman who was unable because of the man who had now died that she was married to to have kids. You now had a responsibility to impregnate her and extend her line. This is called the kinsman redeemer. This man says, "Ah, thanks, but no thanks. I'm not going to do it. Now, one of the things you should have felt reading through Ruth chapter 4, there's a whole lot of names. There's Ruth, there's Naomi, there's Boaz, names we're familiar with. Then it ends with a whole bunch of names many of us have never heard of before. There's Perez and Aminadab and Ram and Salmon and so on and so forth. But there's one name that's missing, a name that no one knows. We never know the name of the person who was supposed to be her redeemer. His name is blotted out. Commentators tell us that is no accident. They tell us that the reason we don't know his name is because of his disobedience to the word of God. They say the reason why his name forever will never be known is because he chose convenience over obedience to the word of God. I get it. I understand, brother, you've got your own family. You've you've got all these responsibilities. It's financially tough. I get it. And to take on another family and to care for and to provide for them may may put you almost over the edge. But, But where's your faith See, I think the first thing we learn about legacy is that legacy demands obedience. There is no lasting legacy unless there is faithful obedience to the word of God. Is this not what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 7 as he is reaching his crescendo? Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, look at it with me. Everyone who hears these words of mine, watch it, and does them, and does them, and does them. Obedience will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not, does not, does not do them, that would be disobedience. We'll be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Please notice, and I'll toss this in here for free, that obedience to God's word does not incubate you from the storms of life. Both the obedient and the disobedient encounter storms. Some of you all are wondering, why is all this going on in my life? Why am I encountering all this pain? What have I done wrong? The answer could very well be, you've done nothing wrong. It's called living in a broken world. Obedient and disobedient people alike encounter storms. But notice, at the end of the storm, one has a legacy. It's still standing. And one has nothing to show for it. 
what makes a person endure the storm is faithful obedience and implementation of the word of God in their lives. Sometimes storms are like proverbial stress tests. God just wants to lift up the hood of our lives and expose what's really there. Sometimes God says the only way you can really know if your faith is authentic and genuine is to go through something because storms lay us bare. They show us, are we following Christ for the benefits package? Or are we following him because he's worthy? If you want a legacy, it's obedience, 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 obedience to the word of God. I like the USC football Trojans. I got one amen. I know this is dangerous. This is Pac-12 country. I shouldn't say that. But I like them. I kind of fell in love with them in the early 2000s. I mean, that's when they had Reggie Bush and Matt Leinart, and man, they were something to behold. 2004, they win the national championship. They beat a team in the Orange Bowl, and banners went up, great celebration. It was wonderful. And then years later, the NCAA found out that, that one of their primary weapons, one of their best players had been living in disobedience and violations of the rules. What the NCAA did, they came back around to that 2004 team and they made them vacate all their wins, pull the banners down, vacate their championships. And now, if you were to step on USC's campus, it's almost as if 14 years later, 2004 never existed. Why? Disobedience. This is exactly what Jesus is saying. Brian, when you live in disobedience... You will be like this man. His name has been vacated, vanished. So I got to ask you today, what foundation are you building your life on? I hear the words of Joshua when he says, choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me in my house, I'm building my house not on what I think is right, not on what the culture says, but on the timeless truth of the Word of God. Legacy demands obedience. <laughs> Secondly, legacy demands selflessness. Again, verses 5 and 6, here is Boaz. He makes the proposition out of deep integrity. He says, look, you've got an opportunity here And quite frankly, this man says, thanks, but no thanks. Again, I want you to think of it. I I kind of get him. And and let's, let's not judge him. Let's not be so quick to just dismiss him. If we're in his situation, here he is raising a family. And then he's got to start another one. I understand how he's feeling. But then Boaz steps in there. He very well may already have his family, kids. He's an older man, maybe even grandkids. And he says, since you won't do it, I'll do it. And while we don't know that man's name, we know Boaz's name. And why do we know Boaz's name? Because he was utterly selfless. He says, I'll make the sacrifice. I'll take on the extra responsibility. I'll pay the price. I'll just just add to it. I'll, I'll work more hours if I have to. Whatever it takes, Ruth, I've got you covered. Selflessness. Sacrifice. This is the stuff of legacy. Many of us have read Jim Collins' classic book, Good to Great. It's a great business book. It's a great leadership book. He talks about level five leaders and what sets level five leaders apart from every other kind of leader. Humility. Selflessness. The ability to to absolutely, positively be humble, in the words of Kendrick Lamar, to round out the hip-hop trio. Be humble. 
be humble. If you just take a peek in biblical history and world history, some of the greatest leaders were some of the most humble, 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 humble people. Listen, I, in, listen I'm, I'm not here to, to castigate our President Donald Trump, but any objectivity will say he's not the most humble person in the world. Got one clap on that. I'm not attacking his policy. I'm not attacking personally, but great leaders are humble. Great leaders aren't in it for power, for prestige, to make their name great. Great leaders see the bigger picture, and they're all about making it great for others. If I have to lay down my life in the process, that's what I'll do. Peter, James, and John, they quit their jobs to follow Jesus. Think of the selflessness there. Levi, the tax collector, who's later named Matthew, he quits his job to follow Jesus. Jesus Christ, think of his selflessness, dies on a cross for our sins, who was in in very essence God. Think of the selflessness there. I'm thinking now of Harriet Tubman. Think of her selflessness. Here's a woman, she's living below the Mason-Dixie line as a slave. She breaks away, she finds her freedom, but she doesn't get up north in freedom and pretty much sits back on easy street and say, I got mine, now you get yours. No, dozens of times she puts her life on the line because she's not thinking ultimately of herself, she's thinking of the greater good of her people, selfless, selfless, selfless. And she deserves to have her picture on a $20 bill. Selflessness. Some of you all, let me save you 150 bucks an hour in counseling. Because you're going through a bad marriage right now. Try humility. Try dying to yourself. Selflessness. Pastor, give me something practical. Give me something practical I can do. I want to focus in on parents now. Let me just give you, I'm really concerned about families. Let me just give you something practical. There's a guy in in church history. His name is Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards is called America's foremost theologian. Him and his wife, Sarah, they have 11 children back in the 1700s. Jonathan and his wife, Sarah, decided to make a practice that every single day, listen, they would pray for each of their kids on through the fifth generation daily. Pray for their kids, their grandkids, great-grandkids, great-great-grandkids, great-great-great-great-grandkids daily. 150 years after they died, someone actually wondered what happened to their seed. Here's what they discovered. Look at it with me. Jonathan and Sarah Edwards, that union produced one U.S. vice president, one dean of a law school, one dean of a medical school, three U.S. senators, three governors, three mayors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 60 doctors, 65 professors, 75 military officers, 80 public office holders, 100 lawyers, 100 clergy, 285 college graduates. Most were Christians who served and deeply loved the Lord. You might call it coincidence. I call it providence. Providence born out of a selflessness. I'm here to tell you that all that I've accomplished in my own life, I'm not that smart, I'm not that gifted, I'm not that able. I am writing the prayers of my parents. My dad once told me, you need to know, son, there hasn't been a single day of your life in which I failed to pray for you. I am covered by the prayers of my parents, selfless, selfless. Finally, legacy not only demands obedience and selflessness, but but as we're going down these paths, here's what will happen. We'll catch greatness along the way. I want us to turn our attention as we close to A list of names, beginning in verse 18. We don't get this. 
We're Americans living in the 21st century. Most of our homes, I'm probably sure, if I were to walk into your house, I'm not going to see a written out genealogy in your home. But genealogies were frequent in antiquity. And to give you a little bit of a of a teaching into how the ancients thought. Whenever the ancients saw a genealogy, a list of generations, a list of names, watch it, they always paid attention to the first name and the last name. Because these two names would tell you everything you wanted to know about that person. Here's Ruth, her genealogy, as she's engrafted into the people of God through her union with Boaz. And the first name that you see in verse 18 is a guy by the name of Perez. Perez is the son of the union with Tamar and Judah. Perez was in his mama's womb alongside his twin brother. The Bible says that as his mother is giving birth to twins, that it was actually Perez's brother who sticks his arm out first. Midwives take a scarlet thread and they tie it around his fist, his wrist to to denote that he was coming out first. And then all of a sudden he just withdraws that arm. Perez then pokes his head out and he comes out first. The midwives are shocked. In fact, he's called Perez because his name means bursting forth. You need to understand that to the Jew, that if you could trace your lineage directly to Perez, that was high dollar. It was was a statement of being first class. It was a statement of being cut above. Here's this little country girl, Ruth who gets engrafted into the people of God, and in her direct lineage, this Moabite immigrant who wrestled with infertility for years is connected to first-class Perez. The last name on the list is her great-grandson, David. He is seen as the greatest king ever in the nation of Israel. He is esteemed so much that when Jesus comes, he is oftentimes called the son of David. Here is this Moabite girl connected, this commoner, to Perez, first class. And her great-grandson is the greatest king ever. This ain't go ahead, girl. This is go ahead, God. For nothing but God can pull this off. Several years ago, we were amazed that Kate Middleton gets married to Prince William. In fact, if you saw the wedding as I did early in the morning, um, I was there to support my wife. Um, <laughs> maybe. But if you, if you watch that wedding, one of the things you saw is how shocked people were that Prince William would marry Kate Middleton. She didn't come from royal or noble stock. In fact, she was seen as an everyday average commoner. In fact, at that wedding, the announcer said, today a commoner becomes royalty. That's Ruth. That's us. Commoners who by the grace of Jesus Christ become royalty, but it gets gooder. As we end Matthew chapter 1 in the genealogy of Jesus, Matthew is writing out the genealogy of Jesus, and look at what he says. And Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse. i got to stop right here and say this. Do you not notice who Boaz's mama is? His mama is Ruth, I mean, is Rahab. Do you not understand who she is? In Joshua chapter 2, Rahab is a prostitute. She is a whore. What does God do? In genealogies and antiquity, sexist societies, you would never put a woman in a genealogy. But God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, tells Matthew, I want you to write down this woman's name. Write down a prostitute, Rahab. Watch it. 
and he includes a prostitute in the lineage of Jesus. The message is that when it comes to Jesus, it doesn't matter what choices you've made, what good choices, what bad choices. It doesn't matter what sins you've made. In his direct line is a whore. And such were some of us. Some of us are right now in the middle of affairs. Some of us right now are in the middle of lies. Some of us right now are are filing for bankruptcy. But if God can include a whore in his lineage, he can include you as the spiritual progeny of his son, Jesus Christ. So I don't have time for arrogant, legalistic Christians looking at each other and how did you get up in here and I I can't believe you're doing this and look at her, she's holding hands with another woman and look at him and he's gay and look at that and look at that. Look at, it's interesting, God doesn't put your mess out on front street. So what does he do? He says, no, 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 let's open up the closets for everyone to see, that's right. My son Jesus, his great, 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 great grand whatever was a whore. Bet you didn't learn that one in Sunday school, did you? (laughs) And God says, put it in public record. Because you ain't got your stuff together either. So in the lineage of Jesus are worthy moral people like Boaz and flat-out immoral people like Rahab. And that's what the church of Jesus Christ should look like. I don't want to be a part of a church that doesn't make room for both Boaz and Rahab. I don't want to be a part of that. This church will make room for Boaz's, And it will make room for Rahab's. And if you are uncomfortable going to church with Rahab, then you should denounce your faith in Jesus. Because your spiritual great, 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 great grandmama was a whore. So God forgive us as the team comes. God forgive us of our legalism. We need to be reminded of some things. Don't you see? God takes, God takes Ruth by his grace. By his grace. There's nothing she did to deserve it. Any of you watch the, the show The Voice? I love that television show. Here you have contestants trying to get a contract. And what they do, episode one, they come out on a stage with four people with their backs turned to them. And they sing, hoping to sound good enough so that somebody, one of these judges with their backs turned, will hit the button and turn around and say, I want you. They hope their performance is good enough to say, please accept me. That is not how God rolls. God says, I know you can't sing. God says, I know you are a hot mess. And when you come out on stage, my back ain't going to be turned to you. I'm going to be facing you with arms wide open. You ain't got to audition for me. You ain't got to perform for me. You ain't got to put on airs for me. If I can take Rahab and I can take Ruth, do you know who else is included? Bathsheba. If you read Matthew 1, Bathsheba is in there. An adulteress. Oh, the lineage of Jesus is made up with a whole bunch of messed up folk. But last time I checked, that's all of us. Messed up. At my church, we used to say, toe up from the flow up. That's us. We're out of here. We're out of here. This is a grace place. This is a come as you are space. This is a space that welcomes everybody. No matter where you may be in your journey, 
we welcome you. But there's a warning label. When you come to Christ as you are, he's going to love you and he's going to meet you right where you are. But warning, you fool around with Christ, he ain't going to leave you as you are. He's going to change you. And he's going to straighten you out. Would you come? I, I, I want now, I want now our prayer team and pastors and elders, if they could just come down front, fan, fan the front. This is, this is communion Sunday. And I need you to multitask with me. This is the last thing we're going to do today. We're going to come and partake communion. Focused on Ruth's progeny. A little baby boy named Jesus. And in just a few moments, when I invite you to come, I want you to come. If you're on the inside of a section, come around to the inside. If you're on the outside, just file around to the outside. We've got tables in the back, tables down front. If you are physically unable to come, raise your hand in the air, and somebody will meet you right where you are and serve you. But as we're coming, some of you, you're here today, and you're saying, I'm Rahab. I'm Bathsheba. I'm in a spot right now that I shouldn't be in. And maybe you would call yourself a Christian and you've just ventured out in the far country and you just want somebody to pray for you. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, I'm not a follower of Jesus. And I'm just telling you, I just sense that I need to give my life to Christ. We've got people down front who would love to pray with you and show you how you can make a decision my wife and I made years ago that will change your life. Doesn't mean the storms won't come. They'll come. You'll have someone with you, someone who can hold you up in the middle of the storm. Hi, my name is Michael Davidson, and here's what's going on at Abundant Life. Coming in August is our next men's huddle, where we'll unpack what it means to be a godly, courageous man in today's world. Through engaging stories, expert teaching, unscripted interviews, and personal insights, this study calls every man to become bold leaders in their own lives, marriages, churches, and communities. Plan to join the men of ALCF community for this exciting series on Saturdays, August 25th through November 10th, and the cost is $25. In September, we've got some exciting events planned, starting with an evening with Tim Keller, Hosted by Transforming the Bay with Christ, Pastor Tim, a pastor and New York Times best-selling author, speaks about the church as an unstoppable force and shares his views on what a radical Christian community looks like. Join us on Thursday, September 6th from 7.30 to 9 p.m. in the ALCF Sanctuary for this unique event. Tickets are $20. On September 23rd, we launched two classes, Jesus Among Secular Gods and The Art of Parenting. Living in the Bay Area's high-tech center of the world, we are often confronted with questions about science versus religion. In Jesus Among Secular Gods, Valerie Saunders, our Director of Evangelism, uses a video chat workshop format to help us prepare to challenge the isms of modern belief, including world religions and views, and present compelling evidence for revealed absolute truth as found in Jesus. This six-week class helps seekers to explore claims of Christ and will provide Christians with knowledge to articulate why they believe Jesus stands tall above all other gods. The cost is $25, includes childcare with pre-registration. Also on September 23rd, The Art of Parenting, developed by Family Life Today, helps parents feel confident in building a foundation for their children in four key areas, identity, character, relationships, and mission. This eight-week DVD small group curriculum based on Psalm 127.4, features insights and decades of expertise that Dennis and Barbara Rainey gleaned from ministry and raising six children. Facilitated by Zeke and Marie Harvey, we will explore the following topics. The goal of parenting, forming character, applying discipline, building relationships, understanding identity, 
nurturing identity, preparing for mission, and the power of family. The cost is $40 per couple, which includes childcare with pre-registration. Space is limited to 24 couples. Are you new to Abundant Life? Are you interested in learning more about our story, dreams, and values in a welcoming environment with no pressure to join? If so, our guest orientation lunch is just the place for you. Find out what we're all about on Sunday, September 9th from 12 to 1 p.m. in the chapel. And speaking of values, going is one of ALCF's core values. As born again believers, God commanded us to go and make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28, 19. In order to prepare you to go, we invite you to participate in one of four trainings being offered each Sunday in August from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Another great opportunity to go and bring the hope of Jesus to people in need is the Johnny and Friends Bay Area Walk and Roll event on September 15th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Mitchell Park in Palo Alto. Join us for this one-of-a-kind fundraising event. All of the money raised will bring Christ-centered encouragement and practical support to special need families in the community. You can sign up from August 17th through September 15th at johnnyandfriends.org slash bayarea. Now, are you ready for some fun? What about ALCF's annual church picnic? Make plans to join the ALCF community for our most popular event of the year and be part of a great afternoon of fellowship, fun, food, and games. This year's event will take place on Sunday, September 16th from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. at Ringstore Park in Mountain View. And if you're available to help out, please come to our volunteer meeting on Sunday, August 12th from 12 to 12.30 p.m. To sign up for any of the upcoming events and classes, go to alcf.net slash signups or the ALCF app. To stay connected with everything ALCF, check out the website, app, buy weekly emails, newsletter, social media, and remember, at ALCF, our goal is to make a difference in your life so that you can make a difference in the lives of the people in your sphere of influence. Or as we like to say around here, Abundant Life exists to make a better you for a better world.